Hello and welcome to today's webinar on PWS and orthopedics with Dr. Harold Van Voss from Children's Hospital, Shriners Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. On today's webinar, Dr. Van Voss will briefly discuss some basic information about PWS and focus on the orthopedic topics with an emphasis on scoliosis, its diagnosis, and different forms of treatment. Before we get started, a few notes about participation. My name is Andrea Lucy, and I'm the Membership and Chapter Coordinator at PWSA USA. Your audio is muted when you join the call. Questions can be submitted via the question box on your screen. We should have ample time for questions after the presentation. A recording of this webinar will be available for anyone who missed today's presentation or would like to watch it again. In 1975, parents Fausta and Jean de Tierling learned their child had prader willi syndrome. A referral to the Child Development and Mental Retardation Center, now the Center for Human Development and Disability, at the University of Washington brought the Tierlings together with other parents and professionals acquainted with the syndrome. Together, these committed individuals formed a group called prader willi Syndrome Parents and Friends, now prader willi Syndrome Association. Four decades have passed since PWSA USA's founding, and we remain unique in the terms of the breadth and depth of all that we offer. For over 40 years, the commitment and support of our community has enabled us to fund life-changing research, deliver life-saving resources and support, and spread awareness and education to make the PWS community stronger than ever. PWSA USA continues to be a self-sustaining, internationally recognized leader, empowering those affected with prader willi syndrome to enjoy a productive life in an informed and accepting community. PWSA USA is a collaboration of families, individuals, researchers, healthcare practitioners, and professionals working together to strengthen our efforts in the areas of awareness, family support, research, education, and advocacy. These five pillars serve as a foundation of who we are, what we do, and what we can yet accomplish as we work together to improve the lives of those affected by prader willi syndrome. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Van Voss has been practicing pediatric orthopedic surgery exclusively since 1994. He joined the staff of the Shriners Hospital for Children, Philadelphia, in 2008, and devotes much of his work to treating very young children with PWS and spine deformities. Welcome. I have now given mouse and keyboard control over to Dr. Van Voss, and it's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, really thankful that the PWS, PWSA USA gave me the chance to uh, do a webinar such as this, particularly now that uh, so many of our in-person conferences have been uh, uh, canceled or postponed. So let's dive right into it. And let's try diving again. Sorry, sometimes the keyboard controls are a little slow. Um, so we are going to talk about uh, a number of different subjects. Um, but we're going to start with the rehab issues that have to do with uh, prader willi syndrome. So children with prader willi syndrome can have um, uh, developmental delays. As my keyboard is having right now. There we go. So early on, we know that children with uh, prader willi syndrome have hypotonia. And this, we can see this even before they're born. Uh, where prenatally, they have a decreased fetal movement. Oftentimes, these children need to be delivered by, by cesarean section because they just don't have enough power uh, to deliver, help deliver themselves. Then as newborns, they have a, a poor sucking ability. They have a weak cry. Um, and as infants and toddlers, they tend to have poor head control. And in the beginning, they have some difficulties with sitting. They have poor postural control as well. Milestones can take twice as long to develop uh, up to 100% delay. So if a typical child is sitting at six months of age, children with prader willi syndrome sit on average about 12 months of age. And where the typical child is walking by a year, uh, children with prader willi syndrome are walking at 27 months on average. So what's the treatment for this? It's therapy, therapy, therapy. We want therapy to start very early on for these children. Sorry, a little keyboard delay again. There we go. Uh, we want to work on balance and motor abilities. So early on, we're trying to get them to have stronger core muscles, get early intervention involved so that the, the children uh, as infants can really be getting physical therapy. When they start sitting and uh, doing well that way, then I want to get uh, some bracing going for their legs to help them with standing because we want to get some better control of the ankles and knees. When they're so hypotonic, uh, they need extra help 
in controlling the ankles and knees. And if you think about standing as being something that's based on foundations, the lowest part of your foundation is the ankle. If that's very weak, then the rest of you can't get upright. So my favorite way to support the ankle and knees is with something called an ankle foot orthosis or an AFO. I like the solid ones. A lot of physical therapists want to know if we can use the hinged ones. But when we're really trying to support the ankle, we want to start with the solid AFOs until they are walking well. Uh, my motto is we get them walking any way possible and then work on points for style. So once they're walking well, we can go for smaller braces. But this is what an AFO looks like. And again, this is only necessary until they are walking well. So basically, start at sitting age, and then we go until they're walking well. This, by the way, I thought was a very innovative thing that uh, a former patient family, a former patient of mine, their family came up with, uh, essentially making a creeper board where the child, before they're able to crawl, uh, they can get on this, they can lie on their belly and use their hands and their feet to kind of propel themselves around. So it's a great way for them to explore their environment as well as work on some uh, strengthening type things. I want to move over and talk a little bit about pest planus or flat footedness. This is a very common thing that we see in Prader Willi. And it happens because they start off very hypotonic. So the muscles on the inner side of their ankles aren't very strong. That's a pretty typical thing to find in young children. The difference is that young children get stronger over time, whereas in a lot of cases, it takes the Prader Willi children much longer to get stronger. So we see pest planus in about 41%. Uh, of our kiddos, and it has to do not only with the the, um, uh, the hypotonic muscles, but also the stretchiness of their ligaments, and that allows uh, the feet to kind of fall into pronation, fall into that flat-footedness where the inner arch is on the ground. And that makes it also a much less efficient uh, foot to walk on. You know, you and I use our arch to be able to propel ourselves forward when we're walking. And if you have an arch that gives way, it, it makes your walking less uh, uh, efficient, which is really tough for somebody who's spending extra energy to walk as is. Uh, it also leads to poor balance. They tend to walk with a wide gaze, uh, wide base, uh, and they uh, take shorter steps because of that. The legs get tired out quicker, uh, and also their standing posture uh, suffers. So here's just an example of what a flexible flat foot looks like and how we try to treat it. So you see how the, the arch on the inside of the foot is flat. And if you just stick something underneath the arch, you really don't get that heel to roll uh, inwards. That heel is very rolled out and just putting an arch underneath the, uh, or just a pattern on the arch doesn't help that get upright. So you actually have to grab the heel and roll that directly underneath the ankle. My favorite brace for doing that is, is this, which is called a UCBL, or the, the short, or the long version is that is University of California Bioengineering Laboratories. That brace is made to kind of roll the heel directly underneath the ankle, uh, as well as help to support the arch, but it does that first by correcting the heel. And then also what we don't show here is that in the front of the foot, on the outer border, it's pushing the foot inwards. Now another brace is uh, this kind of a brace here called an SMO, which a lot of people favor. I'm not as big of a fan of it because I've seen a number of times where this happens. You get the heel corrected, but the front of the foot still rolls to the outside. The SMO doesn't come far enough along the outer board of the foot to push that inwards. And also it, it doesn't, uh, for what these children need, uh, the brace comes a little bit higher than it needs to, in my opinion. But a lot of children get treated with this and do just fine. But you can kind of see here how when the, the foot kind of rolls in, uh, how you get that, that whole positioning of the leg where they seem to be a little knock kneed and everything's kind of leaning in. And you correct them out the braces and everything lines up a little straighter. So our next subject is going to be uh, osteoporosis or weak bones in Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, and osteoporosis means that you have low bone mineral density. So the mineral and bone, of course, is the calcium. Um, and there's been a number of different studies that show that people with Prader-Willi syndrome are subject to this problem. So there's a, a survey that PWSA USA did a number of years ago where 9% of respondents said that uh, their um, person that they were taking care of had known osteoporosis. There was a British study of adults that showed that 29% of them had had a uh, history of a fracture. And in fact, uh, their big point was that 
because people with Prader-Willi syndrome have a decreased pain sensitivity, that a lot of these fractures were discovered late. Another smaller uh, adult study was done in Philadelphia a number of years ago, where they found that 45% of the uh, people with Prader-Willi syndrome had had fractures. Now, in all truth, these were older studies before growth hormone became readily uh, used, but it's still a pretty important point to make here. So the idea is that, uh, or the thought is that people with Prader-Willi syndrome probably have about 20% lower bone mineral density compared to typical people. And this is by using what's called a DEXA scan or a dual energy X-ray absorptometry. And it particularly was found in the lumbar spine, so in your lower back, in the pelvis, and in the, uh, the legs. And it wasn't so much of a difference in the skull, the arms, or the upper part of the back. And this, by the way, is what a DEXA scan looks like and how you can kind of uh, quantitate that. So what's the upshot to that? Well, the treatment uh, really is growth hormone. Uh, and I'm always an advocate with my patients having them take just a regular uh, vitamin that's got vitamin D in there, as well as some calcium uh, supplementation. Nothing extreme. We don't need, want anybody to get kidney stones, but just something so they're they're up to a regular level of vitamin D. We find that most people in the United States are actually low in their vitamin D, and that appear, that uh, includes uh, all of us who think that we're being very healthy. Activity, obviously, a very important thing to get calcium into your bones. So we want the children to be as uh, active as possible, and we also just want to be aware that children are probably prader willi syndrome have weaker bones so that if they take a fall and, and they're not walking well, they're limping, then we want to get an x-ray, even if they don't appear to be in terrible pain. Because again, children with prader willi syndrome have a higher pain threshold that we have to keep an eye on. Also, when we're planning surgery, just to realize that the bone may not be as strong as we typically expect for a child the same age and that we plan around that. Now I want to talk a little bit about hip dysplasia. So we're getting into our two big topics, hip dysplasia and scoliosis. On the left screen uh, or a left uh, picture is what a typical hip should look like when you're done growing. And on the right is a picture of, of a person with Prader-Willi syndrome who has hip dysplasia on both sides, uh, more so on uh, patient's uh, right hip, which is actually they're looking at us in this case, so the right hip would be on your left side. But you notice how the socket isn't quite covering over the ball as well as it is in the uh, picture on the left there. So hip dysplasia, what dysplasia really means is that something has gone abnormally after uh, the uh, structure has been formed. So intrauterinely, when you're putting together a baby, the hip is actually at its best shape right when it's first formed. In the picture down below on the right, what you're seeing here is a very early on picture of a baby hip. And essentially, uh, this hip starts off as a solid block of cartilage. And then, hang on a second, there we go. Then over here, you start getting a little cleft in the cartilage that separates the socket from the ball. So when it's first made, this is when the uh, structure is the, the most sound, the most uh, well uh, created. And then it's later on, probably during pregnancy, when the baby's not kicking around very well, that you first start getting some abnormalities in how the joint is developed. So you get deformities later in pregnancy or, probably, or possibly just after birth. The big concern we have with hip dysplasia is that it can lead to hip arthritis. And that's why we wanted to uh, identify it early and treat it if it needs to be treated. Now, there's also the far end of that, which is a dislocation of the hip where the ball actually comes out of the socket. Now, to me, this is very rare. I only know of two patients that I follow who have had a hip dislocation, both of which were treated before they came to me. Uh, but there are other uh, centers in the United States that report a much higher uh, prevalence of uh, dislocated hips at birth. But the incidence of hip dysplasia, depending upon what study you look at, is someplace between 8% and 30% in children who have Prader-Willi syndrome. Now you compare that to the regular uh, incidence of hip dysplasia of, among typical children, and it's about 1%, about one in 100. So certainly in Prader-Willi syndrome, it's much higher. So what's the prevention for this? Well, the first thing we want to do is identify if there's an issue. And 
in my way of looking at children with prader syndrome, I want to wait until they're up and sitting well, which is when I want to get x-rays of their spine anyway, so I also get x-rays of their hip at the same time. We want children with prader willi syndrome to be as active as possible, and this starts off as little babies. We want them moving around as much as they can because every little movement, even a little bit of a kick when they're in the crib, will help put muscle stress across that hip and help that hip develop. Uh, and if we find a hip that's, that has issues, we want to keep watching the hip to see if it is, is going to improve by itself. Now, what about the instance of hip arthritis? Well, when I originally wrote this talk, I said there have been no reported cases of hip arthritis, and then I've had people come up to me subsequently and say, well, I knew somebody with prader willi syndrome who had hip arthritis, but it's a very low amount, and nobody in the literature has reported on this. Uh, and it's probably because there's too few surgeons uh, who have seen somebody with prader willi syndrome and replaced the hip uh, that they just haven't written it up. So instead, we did a, a project looking at a national database of uh, people who have um, undergone surgeries so there's these wonderful big databases uh, that log everybody who's come through a hospital for surgery. Uh, and there's one particular one that we used. Uh, they look at 7 million annual hospital stays in the United States, and they actually have a way that you can weight the numbers so that it reflects about 35 million, uh, 35 million hospital stays. And what we did is we asked it how many people over an 11 year period from 2004 to 2014 had undergone total hip replacements. And then we tried to find out how many of those had had prader willi syndrome. And what we found was there was about 3.1 million uh, total hip replacements that have been done. This is the weighted number. But of those, only 39 had prader willi syndrome. So if you take the instance of prader willi syndrome at its most rare, which is thought to be uh, overall instance supposed to be one in 10,000 to one in uh, 30,000. So we took it at one in 30,000 and we compare it to the rate of hip replacements, which was one in 80,000 hip replacements. We still find that the rate of hip replacement in people with prader willi syndrome is much lower than in the typical population. Now, what's interesting is that of those that do have a hip replacement, about 70% uh, of them had it done before they were 50 years old, which is pretty much on the young side to have it done. Uh, but it still shows us that people with prader willi syndrome have a lower risk for needing a hip replacement than the typical population. Now, what does that mean to me? It means that we need to figure out who has a very significant form of uh, hip dysplasia and treat it, but the ones who are more mild, we can probably accept a little bit of hip dysplasia. So here's a young lady at five years of age, and what we notice is that neither one of these hips has a very good roof over it, that the uh, socket is not forming a good roof over either side. So and that's what a roof should look like. So in her case, we angled the ball more deeply inside the socket, and as we followed her out, we saw that the roof was developing much better on both sides over time as she got older, as you can see here. Here's a girl who had five and a half years of age. And I would look at this as a, in a typical child to look at this and say, oh, there's no doubt we're gonna have to do surgery. But we continue to follow her. And here she is at seven years of age. The sockets are getting a little bit better. And here she is, um, up against the, I think it's at 13 years of age, and you see very nicely developed uh, hips on both sides. Sorry, for some reason, my screen uh, cut off the very bottom there. Um, but you see a very nicely developed uh, hip uh, on both sides. Uh, so if I had operated on her at five years of age, it would have been far too early. So now we're gonna talk about the main uh, meat of our discussion here, which is uh, scoliosis. So I just wanna get some terms first. Scoliosis is any side-to-side -side curve that you see from behind, because the spine should really be straight up and down. Uh, kyphosis is the normal curve that we all have in our upper back when we look at somebody from the side, whereas hyperkyphosis is if that curve is greater than it should be, if there's more than a 40 degree kyphosis. Same thing with lordosis. Lordosis is the, is the uh, small of our back that we all have in our lower back. And as long as that's under 50 degrees or so, that's a normal curve. 
So what about improbability syndrome? Well, the prevalence is thought to be about 40%. That means if you take a look at all children uh, of different ages, about 40% of them will, be have, will have a curve. Now, the other number is probably the more interesting one, which is if you look at them when they're done growing, nearly 70% of them will have been diagnosed with a curve. Not all those curves need treatment, but it's still a pretty high number. And in fact, if you look at those that are under four years of age, about a quarter of those will have a curve. We think of this as a bimodal uh, age distribution. So we have those younger kids uh, under four years of age will get a curve. And then we have this other group closer to adolescence that can also get a curve. And in between, it's a little bit quiet in terms of developing new curves. The big trick is uh, discovering a curve because for some reason, children with Prader-Willi syndrome can hide their curves much better than typical children. And this probably has something to do with the way the spine rotates. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you take a look at this young man here, you say, well, there's probably a curve going on. He's a little asymmetric. If you look at the, uh, the uh, folds he has in his back, but here's his x-ray. He's got a nearly 100 degree curve that you probably, uh, that I at least wouldn't have suspected from the uh, picture we have here. This little uh, year and a half old girl, girl, unclear if she's just standing funny or she's got a maybe a mild curve. But then there's her curve, it's over 100 degrees. So there's always a question about whether uh, obesity has anything to do with the curves. And in fact, what we found is that there doesn't seem to be much of a difference in the uh, body mass index of children with and without scoliosis. And in fact, a lot of these curves happen before uh, the children get obese or get to the age where they could get obese. And we figured that most of these curves, especially the young children, are more due to hypotonia, to the, the weak muscles that are supporting the spine. Now, it's very important to keep control of obesity both to be able to detect a curve if one happens, or to be able to uh, brace the curve well if we have to treat it. In 2007, uh, PWSA USA did a survey. And out of that, we found that uh, females have a little higher chance of developing scoliosis, but between boys and girls, if you have a curve to start off with, neither one has a greater risk of that curve getting worse. If we look at the difference between UPD and deletion, it, it appeared that UPD is a slightly higher risk for developing scoliosis compared to deletion. But again, once you have a curve from the survey, it suggested that there was no higher risk of, uh, of a child with UPD versus a child with deletion having a progression of that curve. We're going to come back to that in a little bit as we go on here. There's a new survey going on uh, from FPWR, and we're very interested to see what those new results will show because we're uh, this survey is being done now that uh, growth hormone is much more regularly used. So we expect that it probably has some differences on what we see in the children with scoliosis. Now, what's the treatment rationale uh, for uh, addressing scoliosis? Well, a lot of it has to do with the severe curves causing uh, cardiopulmonary compromise or affecting the heart and the lungs. So if you have a big curve, like we see over here in the x-ray, the lungs don't have enough room to develop. If you look over here, you'll see that on this side, the rib cage is kind of flattened out from side to side. And on this side, the rib cage is actually shorter from top to bottom. So on both sides, the lungs are getting squished. And when they're squished, it makes it harder for them to put oxygen into the bloodstream. And then there's something called core pulmonale. So when you're squishing the lungs, you're also making it harder for the heart to push blood through the lungs. And as the heart keeps on working harder and harder, it starts becoming uh, too muscular to work well and you get something called core pulmonale, you get failure of the heart. Now, this usually doesn't happen until curves are 80 to 90 degrees, but you can start seeing some smaller changes already when curves are just over 60 degrees. So let's start off with the very small uh, kiddos here. So here's a, a girl who's a year and a half old, and you can really see that she's got this kind of hypotonic way of sitting. She sits kind of slouched, uh, appears to be kind of collapsing downwards. And in her x-ray, she already has a 43 degree curve there. Now here's something from the literature. They had a girl here, five years old, with a considerable curve, a 78 degree curve. 
And you can see by looking from the side of her again, she looks so much slouched together. So when we're talking here about treatment, and we're still trying to figure out what is the best way to treat uh, children with uh, Prader-Willi syndrome who have scoliosis, there's not a whole lot to go on from the literature. Not a lot of people have published things. Uh, so most of what you're going to hear are my opinions, which is based on accumulated experience of the research we've done on our patients here. Uh, and hopefully over time, we're going to have more and more of this into the, um, the literature so that more people can share on this. The first thing I think is very important is identifying people who have curves. So I think screening is uh, very important to do, but I want to wait to screen until children are sitting. There's been the occasional case where somebody has a, an obvious very big curve way before they start uh, sitting. So we can get an x-ray lying down and see what that curve looks like. But for the rest of your, the rest of the kids, your typical child with Prader-Willi syndrome, I want to wait until they start sitting. So someplace between a year and year and a half so we can get an x-ray with gravity pushing across the spine. And then we tend to do that yearly until they're about four years of age or so. If they haven't developed a curve by four years of age, then we'll take a break for a while until they get closer to adolescence. We wanna do physical therapy with every child early on, uh, and that includes the children who have scoliosis to keep on working on their back strength. Casting is for children uh, that have a curve early on, they're still small. We used to say that we'd only cast until the children were three years of age, but that's been changing a lot over time. And the bracing are for children that are too old for casting, but curves that are over 20 or 25 degrees where we're trying to uh, control the curve. And the surgery are for curves that are roughly over 45 degrees. So let's talk a little bit about therapy. On therapy, we want to work on trunk strengthening. We want to do some work on sensory integration, having the patient understand where their body is in space so that they uh, have more awareness and they can try to write up their uh, posture themselves. Uh, for most children, we want to keep them down until they get stronger and they can sit by themselves. So all of us um, who have children know that it's kind of fun to get the kids up sitting. Uh, and we want to help them with that as much as possible. The problem is with the Prader-Willi child, if you put them into a sitting position, they tend to slouch. So we really want to wait until they can get themselves into a sitting position by themselves before we let them do a lot of sitting. Because before that, if we let them slouch and they start a curve, the slouching is going to accentuate the curve. That's why we want to kind of keep them down. We'd rather have them spend a lot of belly time uh, so they're trying to pull their head up. That does a great job of strengthening their back. When we're feeding them, we want to have them lean against the back of the seat. So have a seat that uh, reclines just a little bit so they can lean against it. It's important to know that children with Prader-Willi syndrome develop their arms and leg strength before they develop their trunk strength, which is the reverse of what most children do. So I usually give this talk with Janice Agarwal, who's a uh, physical therapist who knows so much about uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. And she always likes to say her favorite form of physical therapy is hippotherapy. So you get the kids up on horses. Uh, they need to work on their head, trunk, and leg control when they're on a horse. Uh, and the movement of the horse, it encourages the body uh, to exercise because you have to counter what the horse is doing. But to the kids, it feels like playtime and they love being up on the horses. Therapists are are there to help provide support or to do resistance type ex exercise to make it harder for the child and build their muscle strength some. Uh, Janice also likes uh, soft proprioceptive uh, suits, uh, different th garments that the child can feel what their body is doing, gives them a little bit of uh, proprioception and it helps to uh, encourage the muscles that you use to uh, sit up straight to work. Something like the Theratog or the spine core. Now, a quick thing here that I need to always throw in is that it's important to note that some curves are going to progress despite our best treatment and everything that you try to do for them. Now, that's not to be a downer. I think that we should do everything we can to prevent these curves from getting bigger. But just that, just to know that if a curve does progress, um, it's unfortunately uh, some of these are just are going to do that. So our strategy is to control these curves as long as possible. If we have a big one that is going to get bigger, that is going to need surgery, we want to control it so the child is as old as, as possible before surgery happens.
But let's talk a little bit about casting. So like we said, casting is usually for children um, starting at a sitting age. And we used to say it was only good for children that were about uh, three years of age, but I've actually gone out to casting children as old as six or seven years of age if the parents are comfortable with it. And the reason for that is that we used to cast until three years of age and then go on for the really big curse to some kind of a surgical treatment. But now we've been realizing that we want to extend the age of that surgical treatment until five or six years of age. So the casting is done under anesthesia. For children under two years of age, we change the cast every two months. Between two and three years of age, we change it every three months. And over three years of age, we change it every four months. And we keep casting until either we've reached a goal, which hopefully is getting the curve small enough that we can move on to a brace, or that we plateau out, that we've done several uh, casts, the curve hasn't gotten any smaller, then we say, let's just go to a brace and uh, realize that we're gonna have to be in a brace long-term. So post-treatment is always a brace. Uh, in, this, in the curves that we can uh, bring down a fair amount, the brace is only for a year. Now, here's that point that we're talking about with the chest rotating. So in the typical curve, what happens is when you get the uh, scoliosis, your spinal column actually will rotate. And when it does, it kicks some of the uh, ribs more in, uh, backwards and some of the ribs more forwards. And that's why in this person over here who's bending forward, you see something of a prominence here. So she has a right-sided curve, and that's what's making the ribs on the right side stand up. Now, in prader willi syndrome, we think that they get less of that rotation, which is probably why we see less of those uh, uh, the rib prominences. This is what the uh, research, uh, what, what the casting kind of looks like. We have a certain table where we have. Uh, a head halter traction, so traction at the head and then traction at the pelvis. So we can we can stretch them out a little bit. They're suspended by a bar at the pelvis and a, and a bar at the shoulders. But this gives us complete access around the body. So we can wrap round and round. And they're trying to derotate that chest. We talked about how it's rotated, so we want to derotate that chest as we're applying the cast. So this is what our research table looks like, our casting table looks like. And here we have some pictures. Uh, again, so here's the traction going across the head. Here's our traction at the pelvis. But here I have access to ro to uh, place my plaster around the body. So you wrap it on, then we mold the, uh, the patient. And then we make cutouts. As you see here, I make a little cutout in back as well. So we have a big cutout for the belly. Let me wrap on the final color. And here's our final product. Nice big belly cut out here. Uh, so we looked at the patients that we had done cast. We had 37 uh, patients with prader willi syndrome that we had casted since 2008, of which 34 had more than two years of follow-up. Uh, and our criteria for casting were, were children who had a curve over 25 degrees. And the ages were anywhere from where the child first started sitting up until five years of age was the oldest child that we started casting. So our results were that on average, we started casting about 32 months of age, although it was as, uh, as young as just over two, uh, sorry, as young as just over one year of age and as old as over five years of age. And the average number of casts that we applied were eight casts, although it was as few as three and as many as 18 for the really big curves. And the average follow-up after we finished casting uh, was uh, between four and a half and five years. So that we had one category that we called the cured category. These were children that they got casted until the curve was under 20 degrees for a few casts or was in the low teens. And then what we did is we put them in a brace for a year. And at the end of that year, they came out of the brace. So 12 of those patients, seven of them had UPD and five had deletion. Their uh, initial curve was uh, 44 degrees, but it was anywhere between 27 and 80 degrees. And here's a child who had the 80 degree curve. And sorry, we're just a little slow again. There we go. That's what he looked like at the end of his casting. 
So for the whole group at the end of casting, the uh, average curve was uh, 15 degrees, but they were all under 22 degrees. So we had about 66% improvement. The number of casts uh, varied between three and eight. And the total casting time uh, was about a year and a half as, on average, uh, but up to 28 months. Uh, and then when we uh, reviewed them all, they had been out of cast for about 50 months. And at that time, the average uh, curve was about 16 degrees, although that kiddo with the 80 degree curve, it had something of recurrence. He was back up to 66 degrees at seven years of age. Then we had the controlled group. This is a, a group that had large curves to start off with, and we we're just trying to keep them in control until it was time to do surgery. So there were three children with deletion and one child with UPD. Uh, this first one here started off with a 54 degree curve uh, and she was in cast for about 15 months and then unfortunately she started having respiratory issues and could no longer tolerate the cast. And that's when her curve just took off. It became what you see on the bottom right there. So she ended up getting surgery. We'll be talking about the surgery in a little bit. And we have these three others who had curves uh, between 84 and 106 degrees, and they were all in CAS uh, for about four to uh, four and a half years, um, and then underwent surgery someplace between six and six and a half years of age. So that was a nice time to, that we could extend them out before we had to go to surgery. And we had 18 patients uh, who neither graduated nor went on to surgery. So these were the braced group. And 10 of these had deletion, seven of them had UPD, and we actually had one child who had a methylation defect. And our initial curves were 55 degrees on average, but it was up to 84 degrees. Uh, they, they came down to 35 degrees at the end of casting. Uh, and it was an average of seven casts over uh, 27 months. Uh, and the follow-up um, was uh, 46 degrees. So let's talk about about a few cases here. Here's a 17 month old boy with a 32 degree curve. You can see in his first cast how he straightens up pretty nicely. He's fairly flexible. Uh, four casts later, out of cast, he has a 14 degree curve. And on the right is where he's in his first brace. You can see how the curve is really well uh, adjusted with the brace there. So after two and a half years out of cast at four years of age, looks like he's nice and straight. Uh, then he's out of cast for six years at eight years of age, getting a little bit of a curve. Um, now he's nine years of age. He's gotten a little bit of a curve back. It's a 22 degree curve and he's in a nighttime brace uh, currently. So casting in prader willi syndrome is still somewhat new and we don't know how things are going to wind up. Uh, it's uh, optimistic even in this child's case where he did have a big curve to start off with and we were able to get it to the point that he could be without a brace for a period of time, rather than looking at his initial curve and uh, watching it progress and thinking about something surgical early on. Now here's a girl who's a year and a half old. She's got a deletion type of prader willi and she has a large curve, 106 degrees. So typically, uh, before we started doing casting, if I saw a child with a 106 degree curve, I would try to probably tried to put them in a brace for a period of years uh, and then get very frustrated and move on to surgery when she's still quite young. But here we got her down, her first uh, cast just about uh, made the curve half as small and we continued to cast her. So after she's now here two and a half on the uh, right, on the, sorry, on the left picture, you see the curve is down to about 60 degrees out of uh, cast and 51 degrees in cast. And we're able to carry her along for about four years of casting, keeping the curve about 60, 65 degrees. And then when she was almost six years of age, we went ahead and went to doing surgery for her. So what pr helps predict if you're gonna have somebody who gets a cured curve versus someone who's not gonna go into the cured group? Well, we didn't find any differences in terms of boys versus girls. We didn't find any differences versus of a right curve versus a left curve nor if the curve was in the upper back or the lower back. Um, and the age that we started casting did not seem to make a whole lot of a difference. The only thing that really made a big difference were if a curve started off under 50 degrees. So if you, if you had a curve that was under 50 degrees compared to a curve that was over 50 degrees, we had a nine times better chance of curing that curve. 
but we still don't know what really makes the big difference here between the different types of curves. Now, a big point though is that casting is survivable. Here's a 17-month-old boy with a 55 degree curve. Uh, five casts later and about uh, 15 months, we were able to get him nicely corrected. He was in a brace for 12 months and then he was able to come out of his brace. So he's done very nicely. Uh, and then here's another uh, slide to show you that casting is survivable. It, it always seems so difficult to start off with, but I've always been amazed how well parents and families adapt to this. That's not to say that they don't enjoy the, that they, uh, not to say they enjoy the casting, but they're able to uh, carry on with life even with the casts on. Now, what about bracing? So bracing is for curves that are uh, greater than 20 or 25 degrees. And we try to use the brace basically to prevent curve progression. So typically we don't think of braces as being able to make a curve smaller, whereas casting can make a curve smaller. Uh, it can be difficult to uh, fit uh, large children in braces. Uh, but here's a kind of an example. So you see the child on the left, very hypotonic, put her in a brace, and we get her to straighten up a fair amount. We're able to use the brace to kind of squeeze on the curve. Uh, and here's another a little example. Um, on the left, we have the child, she's got a 32 degree curve. We put her in a brace for four years and we're able to slow the curve down. So it progresses 12 degrees over time, uh, but that was less than we would have expected uh, when we're starting off that 32 degree curve. And here's some nicer information. So here's a child, five years of age, 46 degree curve. In her uh, daytime brace, we're able to get that curve down to 22 degrees. And then we also put her in a nighttime brace, which could really stretch the curve out to two degrees. Now watch what happens. Four years later, this curve is now to, down to 21 degrees, and we can uh, think about getting her out of a brace for a period of time, see how she does. Now here's a 10-year-old uh, child with a 41 degree curve. So typically, if I saw a 10-year-old with a 41 degree curve, I'd expect that they'd go on to a, uh, needing surgery. Um, but there they are in the daytime brace and in the nighttime brace. And subsequently, here they are at 13 years of age and the curve has come down appreciably. So suddenly we're no longer looking at a curve that's gonna need surgery uh, and actually have found that we've been able to make the curve smaller in the brace. This is a very unexpected finding, uh, at least in typical children. Now we're looking at an x-ray from the side and what you're seeing down here is instead of being having a lordosis, having a small in the back, they actually have a kyphosis down here. And this uh, child is about a year and a half old. So we placed him in a brace and gradually have gotten that to improve over time. So he's really improved the uh, posture that he has. Now here's the flip side of it though. Here's a 10 year old who had curves that were both about 30 degrees. And we, can't, we braced her but over time, the curve continued to slip away from us to the point that we ended up having to do surgery on her. Now, what about surgery? Well, surgery, uh, the criteria for surgery really has to do with trying to prevent curves from progressing in adulthood. So the way we look at it is in general, if a curve is under 40 degrees when you're done growing, 95% of the time, the curve will not get worse. If the curve is over 50 when you're done growing, then it's probably gonna keep on getting worse in adulthood. And between 40 and 50 is something of a gray zone. So our usual indications for surgery are curves that are over 40 or definitely over 50 degrees. What do we wanna do with surgery? We want to align the scoliosis up as best as possible, the side to side curve. But what has been found to be much more important in the long run is making sure that you have the side alignment correct. And we hold everything in position uh, with rods that are connected to hooks, wires, or screws that are grabbing onto the spine itself. Now, surgery in Prader-Willi syndrome has had a very high complication rate. Uh, there's a high rate of infections, uh, which is probably related in a fair amount to skin picking. And so we have a lot of our uh, post-surgical treatment uh, zeroed in on stopping the kiddos from getting to their uh, surgical sites. Uh, and aesthetically, there can be some issues that we need to know about, uh, that the anesthesiologist needs to know about. Uh, children with prader willi syndrome can have some respiratory issues, including apnea, uh, and that we need to be aware of those after surgery. And there could be failure of hardware where the the uh, hardware pulls out from the bone, the, the screws can pull out from the bone and we lose control of the spine. 
uh, and that could be related to the osteoporosis and also to the way that the children balance themselves. So this is the type of thing that I wanna continually educate uh, my colleagues who are treating children with prader willi syndrome, uh, that they know that children with prader willi syndrome are special in that way, that it's not just a child's got scoliosis and this other thing called prader willi syndrome. It's really a child with prader willi syndrome who's got scoliosis. That's the way they need to think of these children. So this is a uh, set of pictures from the literature, child with a uh, six-year-old child with a 90-degree curve, and they did some surgery here. Now, this is an older implant style, but they got a very nice correction. But here's the issue. This six-year-old is gonna grow up to be a full-grown person, but the spine cannot grow anymore. So there'll be a full-grown person with a chest the size of a six-year-old. And that really limits what their lungs can do and really harm, well, really causes them problems in the future. So here's uh, my first patient with prader willi syndrome. It was a six-year-old with a 107-degree curve. And what we did instead was something of a kind of a trolley system here where we anchored uh, rods to the top of the spine on both sides and anchored rods to the bottom of the spine. And they were connected in the middle by these little connection type things, which you can see here. And what we could do then is gradually expand. Every six months, we go back to the operating room, we would loosen up these little connectors and expand out the spine. And then by the time he was 16 years old, we were done lengthening him out. So we got the curve down to about a 50 degree curve. So we made it a fair amount smaller, but then we were done with having to do anything for his curve. Now, luckily there's been a big change in something uh, in the type of uh, implant we can use. So here's another patient of mine, 83 degree curve. And we put in these rods that are known as magic rods or magnetic expansion control rods. The nice thing about these is that I don't have to go to the operating room to lengthen them. I can actually lengthen them in my clinic. So what you can notice is that there's this little clear spot that develops over here, and that is where the rod is lengthening out. So now instead of every six months, every three months we bring the child back and we place this big gizmo on their back. It has some magnets in it and the magnets rotate and they make the little uh, magnets inside the rod right here and right there, make those rotate. And that's what expands out the, the, uh, the implant. So it's been a much, much more gentle way to do it. Now, what about spine fusions? So spine fusions are for children with a big curve that we expect to be over 50 degrees when they're done growing, but these children don't have a whole lot of growth left to them. Uh, we want to avoid going through the chest to get to the spine. Uh, so we usually just operate from behind. Uh, and the newer techniques that we use that uh, use what are called pedicle screws are much better in the, um, the thinner bone. So we can really get a good grab on the bone and correct them out. So here's a 15 year old boy, the large, uh, he's got a, a good size scoliosis, but also a large what's called kyphosis. Again, so that big curve to the upper part of his back. This is what his back looks like after surgery. Here he is before surgery. And here is after surgery. So this is, we have the rod on either side here. We have the screws pretty much at every level. So we have a, a very firm fixation here to his back. And here you, see, here you see him from the side where we've tried to reconstruct the normal uh, posture. So before we get to the operating room, we wanna make sure the children are as healthy as possible. So we always wanna get a sleep study to see if they have any apnea. If they have apnea, then we need to get them set up with either CPAP or BiPAP. Sometimes we have the ear, nose and, th ear, nose, and throat surgeons take a look at them to see if there's any issues with the tonsils or adenoids. Anesthesia needs to evaluate these children to see if that they, if that they can intubate them well. Um, they need to know that these children have thickened saliva, so they wanna use, we want to avoid using any medication that's going to dry out the mouth because that's only going to make the saliva thicker. And they need to realize that children with Potter willi syndrome can be challenging to get IVs into and that they may need their IVs longer after surgery. So oftentimes we'll put something called a central line in place. That's an IV that goes into a bigger vein and that can stay in for a week or so. The day of surgery, we want to make sure that these uh, children don't have any occasion to get to any kind of food. Uh, we want to realize after surgery that they have a, pi a high pain threshold because oftentimes anesthesia will, the anesthesiologist will use a little bit of pain from surgery to help wake somebody up. But children with Prader Willi syndrome have that high pain threshold. Um, I'm never in a hurry to get my patients with Prader Willi syndrome extubated. Now, in most cases, we can pull the breathing tube out in the operating room. 
Um, but occasionally it's fine to leave the breathing tube in uh, for a few hours or maybe even overnight until the child is really awake and can breathe well for themselves. And we always want to have them observed in the intensive care unit after surgery. And again, with the CPAP or BiPAP as needed. Uh, again, postoperatively, they have a high pain threshold. Like we said, there could be a, a difficulty in terms of uh, getting them to breathe right away or to wake up right away after surgery, but it's also wonderfully helpful when we try to get these children up and walking. They're real champs in getting out of bed and getting up and walking. They're also uh, pretty good when instructed to breathe deep and to cough. But it, again, it is that hypotonia and that breathing issue that's a problem for us. So we want to make sure that we get these children coughing right away to clear their uh, their lungs. The skin picking is an issue. So I will put these children in braces after surgery, primarily to keep their fingers away from the incisions. And they have a lot of difficulties with uh, getting their digestive system back on track. In a typical child, if you do a big scoliosis surgery, it takes two or three days before they're able to tolerate uh, regular meals. Whereas in prader willi syndrome, it can take up to a week. And if we try to move too quickly, their belly gets very distended, everything shuts down, and you have to start all over. So we have to go very slowly here. And that's also, we sometimes need an IV for longer. But here's a young lady. Here's her curve. She had a pretty big size curve and straightened out nicely. That's what she looks like afterwards. Uh, there is a, an issue that happens at the upper part of the neck where they tend to be very kyphotic. As you can see here in uh, my uh, first patient with prader willi syndrome, you see he's got this big kind of uh, step off here to his spine at the very top. And it's probably because I tried to make him too straight initially. So, in most of us, when you drop a line from the top of the spine, it will go through right about through the, the um, upper part of the pelvis here. But with prader willi syndrome, children seem to want to be uh, balanced so that their head is a little bit forward of their spine, forward of their pelvis, as you see in these two pictures here. This is a, a well-positioned child. But here's where we get into trouble is when we get somebody a little too straight in their spine, and what they try to do is bring their head further forward than it needs, than we would think it needs to be, because I would look at this and say, oh, somebody did a nice job correcting it, but it's actually too straight for what the child with prader willi syndrome wants. And so they start developing, in this child's case, she started developing some problems below where her fusion went, but that was so that she could bring her uh, head more forward and stand more comfortably. A uh, similar thing happened here. This child had a, a surgery done and they just had a terrible collapse over the top of their uh, fixation here. So we had to straighten her up to the point that we could get her head more in line to where she wanted it. And this young man here had a similar issue where again, he was straightened up too far. You notice at the very bottom here, he just compensated himself. He, he uh, collapsed on his spine to bring his head further forward. So we had to correct him out. Now, a quick word about growth hormone and scoliosis. There's always been a concern that having children on growth hormone can make their scoliosis worse. And this actually stems from a different condition called Turner syndrome, where there's some evidence that maybe having children on growth hormone can make the scoliosis worse. And actually, uh, the literature seems to suggest that that's not true either. But people made that generalization to prader willi syndrome and suggest that we should take the children off growth hormone when we found a curve. The interesting thing that came out of the um, prader willi survey, uh, PWSA survey in 2007, is we found that for every month delay in starting growth hormone, there was actually a 0.7% increase in the need for needing a surgery. Uh, compared to those that have been started on growth hormone earlier. So we really found that the, this um, growth hormone seems to protect a little bit against getting uh, a large scoliosis. And on top of that, growth hormone does so many other important things for children with prader willi syndrome that we think it's very important to keep it going even if they get scoliosis. So I want to thank all my patients with prader willi syndrome for having taught me everything they have. Uh, and I'm really uh, important, uh, really uh, open for any questions that you may have at this time. And Andrea, I'll turn it thank over you. to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Van Bos, for your presentation today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the question box on your screen. 
Uh, Dr. Van Bussel, we're waiting for some people to submit their questions. I hear a lot of talk about newer procedures for large scoliosis curves, where the curves are not fused, but instead a tether is used along the front of the spine. What is your take on that? So the tether is a really exciting uh, new method that has been developed, and actually our hospital has been very much in the forefront. I don't do tethers myself, uh, but I get asked this question a lot about children with prader willi syndrome, whether or not it's appropriate for them. I know of, I think, two or three children who have had it done, um, and um, it, it's not clear what the results have been. I'm very worried about this. First of all, it's a new technique where we haven't quite figured out in typical children uh, what the, the boundaries are for this procedure. The other thing is that uh, when we go through the chest on children with Prader Willi syndrome for surgery, uh, there's a higher um, complication rate with that, particularly for pneumonias. But the thing that's much more important has to do with the strength of bone. So this uh, technique really asks for the bone to be very strong because you're trying to grab the bone, hold it in a good position. So as the child grows, you actually get a little bit of a spontaneous correction. Uh, but as as we've seen uh, with these children with Prader-Willi syndrome, that they actually uh, have weaker bone. And so it may not work as well. The screws may pull out on them or they may not get the correction. They've gone through surgery, not get any correction out of it. So I am uh, suggesting that people uh, uh, continue to sit back and watch to see how this works for children with other children before having children with Prader-Willi syndrome undergo this procedure. Thank you for that. Um, we also have a question from Nancy. She wants to know, what is your recommend, recommended treatment for both um, orthotics and scoliosis in the older child? My son is 14 and has a slight curve, 16 degrees last check, that seems to be progressing with typical therapy. He also still walks with pronation, flat foot, and wide gait, but has been out of um, orthotics for years. Also, what are your thoughts on growth therapy? Okay, so three questions there. Uh, and I'll probably need a little reminder of what they all are, but let's start off with the spine. So in a 16-year-old, in a typical boy of 16 years of age, you'd expect the child to be done growing. And bracing is only helpful as long as somebody's done growing. You're trying to prevent progression of the curve with growth. So if he's got a, um, a smaller curve uh, and he's 16, then I would say get a study to verify his bone age. So there can be a difference in when children mature. Not every child matures where the textbook says they should. Um, so what you do is you get an x-ray of the hand. The hand has a whole bunch of growth plates in it, and you can more accurately predict what the body thinks it's doing. So if all those growth plates are closed in the hand, you can say, well, now your child is skeletally mature. If it's a small curve, you start getting them out of the brace. If it is a bigger curve, it's if, a, if it's a curve over 50 degrees or so, uh, then you have a serious talk about whether or not you need to do something surgically. Now, in terms of the feet, very similar type thing. If you have a child who's got flat feet, um, for me, the braces are there when they're growing to try to train the feet to hold a better position. And then what I say to the parents is, when they're done growing, then we can look to see how they're doing. If their feet have corrected, then they were great. We stopped the braces, no problem. If their feet haven't corrected, but they're comfortable, then that's fine. That's all we need to do. If their feet haven't corrected, but they're uncomfortable or they're not walking well because they have so much collapse in their feet, then we can maybe talk about some surgical things that we do for uh, typical flat footedness to get the, the foot to align better, to get the heel underneath the ankle and get the front of the foot to align with the heel. And the third question was? Um, it was, what are your thoughts on the scroth therapy? C or S-C-H-R-O-T-H therapy? Yeah, the, the, the Schroth therapy. So um, our hospital has an active program during the summer doing Schroth therapy. Um, but it's a very intensive therapy and it takes a lot of cooperation that even for typical children is oftentimes hard for them to do. Uh, we always like making jokes about how this was developed in Germany and that they're, they're very regimented and all the children listen to exactly what's said. But having said that, uh, it's something that uh, families with a child with Prader-Willi syndrome who have tried it, have told me that it's just, it seems a little too intense for the child to be able to follow through with all the instructions and keep doing that day after day. 
Um, and on top of that, it's not very clear uh, from the literature whether or not that therapy makes a lot of difference to most of the curves that they're treating. Thank you. We have a question from Brian. Um, his question is, our pediatrician has not expressed a concern. However, we notice that our son, who is 14 years old, slouches quite a bit and leans a bit. His gait is off as well. Again, his orthopedic um, pediatrician did not feel his hips were out of sort. Do we proceed with an x-ray or wait it out for other signs? Thank you. No, I think at 14, I would certainly get x-rays. I want to get an x uh, a set of x-rays of the spine. And when they get the x-rays of the spine, they can also include the pelvis. So you have a, a one picture uh, of what the pelvis looks like. Uh, and that'll help uh, explain everything all together. Uh, sometimes the, the challenge is trying to get a child with Prader Willi syndrome to stand nicely for the x-ray that they want to move around. Um, and that's why I avoid something called the EOS machine, which is a really great way to get x-rays. It's low radiation, but it takes six seconds to take an x-ray, which for a lot of children is tough to stand uh, absolutely still during that period of time. Uh, and for many of our kids with Prader Willi syndrome, it's new impossible. But I would suggest getting two views of the spine so you can both see from the side and from the back what the curve looks like. Um, and as, if it's just a small curve that the child has, then it's not such a big problem. If it's primarily a slouching that they have, then they can try some physical therapy to see if they can strengthen up the back and get the child to stand better. But the other thing that it may show is, for example, that one leg may be a little bit longer than the other, which occasionally happens in prader willi syndrome, and they can address that at that time. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Sarah. What is the future? It's um, actually a two-part question. What is the future of telehealth since many of us cannot travel to you? Um, she's a new mom, a nine-month-old, seven months adjusted. Um, and also her son has a little curve already and the orthopedic who um, never had heard of prader willi syndrome before until he met us says that the curve is 4% but um, feels that it's not very obvious. So future of telehealth and any comments on a 4% curve in a nine month old? So in terms of telehealth, um, it's uh, certainly during the, the corona crisis here, uh, it's taken off to a fair amount, although over at our institution, we're doing less and less of that. Um, so the occasional patient that we'll interact with, uh, for my practice, uh, I'm almost as happy doing things by email because there's not, a whole lot I can see well. I can't examine a child very well on telehealth for most things. So oftentimes we'll have parents do is just reach out to me by email um, and they can uh, send me the x-rays uh, by email and we can discuss what we see and come, come, uh, come up with something of a plan. Um, and that's oftentimes how we manage patients at a distance. Um, oops. And the other question was, oh, what about the curve? So a uh, when they say 4%, they probably meant four degree curve. And a four degree curve is a very small curve. We typically start treating curves in infants if they're over 20 or 25 degrees. Now, when you have a child who's only six or seven months old, they're not sitting yet. So the x-ray is probably taken lying down. Uh, and that uh, is going to underestimate what the curve looks like because gravity is not going across that curve. Um, but again, if it's that small, I'm comfortable waiting that out for a bit. Uh, and as long as the curve doesn't look to be getting any bigger when you're looking at the child um, to just see what happens. Now, I would want that child to get a lot of tummy time so they start getting better trying to pull their head up. When, they, when they're pulling their head up to look, they're actually strengthening their back a whole lot. Uh, and if you put them on their tummy and you put things in front of them that they want to get to and they're reaching with their arms, that also strengthens their back. So that'd be the first uh, types of therapy I'd try to be doing with this child. Thank you. And it looks like we have a final question from Lisa. Um, she wants to know if you can clarify if the curve is less than 50 degrees at maturity, um, is it less likely for a curve to develop in adulthood? And would you continue nighttime bracing in a child once they've reached their full height to hold the scoliosis in check? So if a curve is, um, if it's over 50, then a very high percentage of those are going to progress. And you pretty much we just figure, even though it's it's 95%, we'll call it 100% uh, when we're looking at a patient just because it's um, it takes some of the guesswork out. Uh, one of the problems is that 
uh, in adulthood, curves progress more slowly. And so sometimes you're looking at someone who's 16 and saying, ah, it's a 50 degree curve. Uh, let's watch it. And then it, the curve is slowly progressing to the point that you finally say at 21, oh, we got to do something about it. Now, my hospital system, I can't see them anymore. I have to graduate them at that point. Um, if the curve is under 40 degrees, then there's a very good chance that the curve is not going to go anywhere. So those curves we'll continue to watch for a few years or until we can no longer follow them. But we're pretty happy that they're going to or pretty satisfied they're going to do well. The ones between 40 and 50 degrees are the ones that are much more in a gray zone. So if I have a child that has, say, a 45 degree curve when they're done growing, what do we do then? We continue to watch them very closely. Uh, and we'll see them maybe in the beginning, when we get them out of their brace, we'll get x-rays every six months. If the curve is staying stable, we'll go to every year. And I also have what I call my line in the sand. I'll say, well, if it varies two or three degrees from one x-ray to the other, that can just be the way the child is standing. But if this curve goes over, and I'll say 48 or 50 degrees, you know, that's gonna be where we pull the trigger and we start moving towards surgery. Well, what about wearing a brace at nighttime or wearing a brace even during the daytime? It's, um, the problem with that is when do you then stop the brace? Uh, because when you stop it, if it's a big curve, if it is a 50 degree curve and you're wearing the brace there to prevent surgery, then the child's gonna probably need to wear that brace their entire adulthood. Uh, because as soon as you stop the brace, the curve is probably going to do what it's naturally going to do. So that's the issue with that. So usually if we have a big curve, uh, when they're done growing, we'll say, well, let's stop the brace and move on towards surgery. Thank you. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions from our attendees today. So thank you once again to our presenter, Dr. Van Bock, for a very informative presentation. If anybody has any additional questions for our presenters, please submit them to info at pwsausa.org um, and we'll forward your email along. You can also keep the conversation going by joining one of our many Facebook support groups. Just send us an email at the info at pwsausa.org if you would like to be added. After the webinar ends, we invite you to take a brief five question survey to let us know how we did. A recording of this webinar will be available for anyone who missed today's presentation or would like to watch it again. Thank you again, Dr. Van Voss. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe and have a good evening. Thanks, everybody, for having me. I appreciate the attention and appreciate the questions. Have a good night now.